Welcome to day one of our U.S. ECOMOS 2020 International Symposium and Conference. The U.S. World Heritage and Social Justice in the 21st Century. I'm Douglas Comer, President of U.S. ECOMOS, the United States National Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Today, we will examine issues associated with social justice, civil rights, and slavery. We will open today with a keynote address between two legendary figures, Robert Stanton and Lonnie, Lonnie Bunch. To say that we are honored and grateful for this is an understatement. This will be followed by sessions addressing international examples of monuments associated with oppression, world heritage sites and slavery, and the interpretation of civil rights sites. Lonnie Bunch is the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian. As Secretary, he oversees 19 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo, numerous research centers, and several education units and centers. The phenomenal Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture was a creation by Secretary Bunch. He transformed what at one time seemed a distant vision into a bold reality. He was appointed by President George W. Bush to the Committee for the Preservation of the White House in 2002 and reappointed by President Barack Obama in 2010. In 2019, he was awarded the Freedom Medal for the Roosevelt Institute, the W.E.B. -E du Bois Medal from the Hutchins Center at Harvard University and the National Equal Justice Award from the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. Robert Stanton is former senior advisor to the Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior and former director of the U.S. National Park Service. He is a continuing source of inspiration to everyone who has had the good fortune to meet him. He's also a former expert member of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, serving for six years from October 2014 to October 2020. An executive professor at Texas A&M University, visiting professor at Howard University, and professor of the practice at Yale University. With his work, he has improved the preservation and management of the nation's rich and diverse natural and cultural resources. More complete biographies of these two incredible people can be found on the U.S. ICOMOS conference website. You have an opportunity now to learn from two people who have made paths to a better place. Now, please welcome Lonnie Bunch and Robert Stanton. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, Bob, it's good to see you as always. My pleasure, Mr. Secretary, Lottie, if you will. I wonder if we could start by talking about why history matters to us. Um, what is it that led us into this profession? Lottie, excellent. But let me, uh, at the outset, uh, join with you in thanking the leadership of uh, U.S. ICOMOS uh, for extending to us uh, this grand opportunity. And I must submit, uh, Mr. Secretary, that uh, we are all honored. We're all humbled by your participation. And uh, to address you <laughs> as uh, Secretary of the Smithsonian, Dr. Lonnie Bunch III. Ladies and gentlemen, our ancestors smile and million and million of others applaud your leadership and support. Lonnie, uh, at the uh, the National Museum on African-American History and Culture, created under your genius, speaks loudly, speaks truthfully about our rich and diverse cultural heritage. And I liken that unto my own experiences with the National Park Service, where I spent 35 years and more recently six years with the Advisory Council, promoting the preservation for the benefit of this and future generations promoting and preserving our heritage. And the question that you just posed 
Why do we do this? Why do we do this? I think, first of all, we have a responsibility to respect and to honor the struggles, achievement, and the contribution of our ancestors. We need to do that. Secondly, we need to be truthful about the contribution that all Americans have made to the development of our countries. Unfortunately, as one would consider our textbooks and other recordings of history, those contributions were not noted. And thirdly, we need to preserve these places to give them encouragement to our young people and future generations. That these places become places of learning, that they will not repeat grievous mistakes that we have made in the past. So to talk about the benefits of historic preservation, museums, historic sites, we could go on and on and on, but it's a noble journey and it's been a pleasure and it continues to be a pleasure working closely with you, uh, Secretary Bunch. My well, life. As I've, always, as I've always said to people that when I grow up, I want to be you, Bob, um, because I think we share a commitment that history is not just about yesterday, but it's about today and tomorrow. And that in essence, um, history to me became something personal and professional. On the one hand, it became a way for me to understand how I was treated in a town where there were few African Americans and some people treated me fairly and some people treated me horribly. And I thought if I understood history, maybe I could understand better um, why some were good and some were bad. But I realized I began to think about this from my lens. I realized that it was also an opportunity to use history to understand this nation and to understand one of the major things that has been a chasm, which has been race. And what was important to me is to think about how do we create a useful and usable history so that the public really has tools that they can use to live their lives, to understand, to find contextualization. In some ways, I realize the reason why I got excited about history is that history allow, allows us all, and especially if we do it right in, in cultural sites and museums, history allows us to define reality and to give hope. Two things that are crucially important, it seems to me, as we grapple with this world we're in, to help people find the contextualization, to find the understanding, to find the clarity, to find the truth, to find all the dark corners of an experience, but also then to use that to still give people hope, to let them know that history tells us a lot about the arc of justice, tells us a lot about what can be achieved yeah. in a nation. So ultimately for me, history was a way to understand myself, my town, my country. And then it became a tool for me to help promote racial justice and fairness. So Excellent. all of my career has been about exploring who has been left out of the narrative. How do we give voice to those that have been silent? And how do we make visible those who've been invisible? Excellent, Lottie, and just what you described makes it such a joy to be on this journey with you. And I too uh, reflect on my own experiences. As an example, I experienced that uh, insidious doctrine, if you call separate but equal, for 24 years of my life. And that had pretty much forced me to take a look at the uh, evolution of our country as it relates to our constitution ratified, I believe, in March of 18, 17, pardon me, 1788. And then to fast track that to the 14th Amendment that talks about justice under the law, equal justice under the law. I think the exact words is equal protection of the laws. And I often wondered uh, that we had that guarantee by the Constitution in 1868. So why was this necessary and why is it necessary that we continue to struggle to achieve that which we promised by a nation of our people over a hundred years ago? I'm trying to find the answer to that. But as I'm searching, we would have to, as Mr. Douglas say, stay in the struggle. Mm -hmm. So that is what I found so admirable by our young people. 
who are taking their concerns to the public forefront. The uh, Black movement, Black Lives movement, that it really matters. And they are making it known that there are some ills, there are some deficiencies in our institution and in our conduct and are not living up to what we guaranteed equal protection of the law. So we need to stay on this journey, Alani. We need to stay on this journey. I mean, I think what's so powerful about what you said is, and I remember receiving a letter, oh, several years ago from somebody who was critical of the work we were doing to build the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And he said, don't you know that America's greatest strength is its ability to forget? And I would argue that really you tell a lot about a nation by what it remembers, by what it builds monuments to, by what it braces its walls and museums. But I think you learn even more about a nation by what it forgets, what uh -huh. it omits. Yes. And in yes. many ways, the, the experience of African Americans, the experience of many others have been omitted because they don't fit the neat narrative. Yes. Because there weren't scholars who were really interested in these stories until, you know, the last 30 or 40 years. And what I think is really important to me is that our job ought to be to recognize that we are not trying to help people understand stories of race or gender as answery stories. We're not really trying to say, here's the way to make up for what has been omitted. What we're really saying is, Americans can't understand themselves if they don't understand these stories. And one Excellent. of the great strengths of what you've done at the National Park Service, what I see cultural institutions doing around the country, is helping America find itself, helping huh. America yes. remember. Yeah. And that's what you're really doing when you're helping people understand a complex, nuanced history. Because I would argue that maybe, in spite, in, even though we give people content that they wrestle with, one of the things I think we do even more importantly is that if we do our jobs right, we're helping our visitors embrace ambiguity. Uh -huh. Because far too often, we as Americans especially, are looking for simple answers to complex questions. It's either yes or no, black or white. And one thing history teaches us is that history is ripe with nuance, complexity, ambiguity. And if we could help the public understand that it's okay to have those debates around the shades of gray, that looking at complexity is a better way to understand who you are rather than looking for simple answers. If we can do that, yeah. not only do we give people an understanding of content, of history, of people's lives, we also give them a tool to help them become better citizens, to help them become better people at helping a country live up to its ideals. Excellent, Lottie. And what you have described, as I have experienced it, is not only playing out here in our country, but as I have traveled, not as much as you, but uh, the, same, the same philosophical and practical approach of individual countries dealing with their heritage, their history, uh, is so evident. I've had the opportunity to visit Robin Islands, which is a world heritage site. Uh, the castles, if you will, in Ghana, the gates of no return. Every country is beginning to re-examine, really research what has been our past. What are the lessons to be learned? How can we use the past to forge a better future? And uh, that is such a challenge, but it's playing out internationally. And certainly I want to applaud the uh, U.S. ICOMOS and certainly the, uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation and specifically my old National Park Service and the Advisory Council all coming together working with the Smithsonian in a collaborative corporate, cooperative relationship uh, to move that concept of dealing with our past to build a better future. And again, I just think there's so much that can be done as we move, move in that direction. Well, I think what you've put your finger on is that these discussions around history are not about nostalgia. They're about national identity. Uh -huh. And so what you see, whether it's debates on what Britishness means in the UK, or struggles to try to figure out what does it mean that many people in Ghana were involved in the trade, slave trade itself. So all of these, and the reason why they're so contentious 
is they're really at the heart of who we are as individuals and as nations. And I think that makes it so hard because it's complicated. And what I think is crucially important is to recognize that our national identities evolve. And so therefore, so should some of the stories we tell, so should some of the monuments we have. And I think the challenge for us is to recognize that it's important to have that tradition that you build on, but you shouldn't be trapped by that tradition. Yeah. You should be able to expand the notions of who we are by different monuments or different museums or different stories or questions that, that are asked in national parks that weren't asked 20, 30, 40 years ago. So I think in some ways, what we're really suggesting is that this work that we've dedicated our life to is really our commitment to helping a country be made better. Yeah. It's our commitment to saying that if the truth shall set you free, then you first need to know the truth. <laughs> and in a way, that's what I think this, the work that you've done has been, is to give people a reservoir of truth, a reservoir of truth that sometimes is bitter. Oh, yeah. Oh, a yeah. reservoir of truth that sometimes people don't want to dip into. That's right. But I think the key is you are made better when you confront and understand yourself fully. Yeah. And then use that to push you to a better tomorrow. Excellent. Excellent, Lonnie. I had the opportunity, Lonnie, in uh, 1984 to attend the First World Congress on Cultural Parks held at uh, Mesa Verde National Park uh, in uh, Colorado. And uh, it was sponsored by Smithsonian Park Service, ICOMOS, and a number of other preservation organizations. And I was asked by then Director of the Park Service, Russell Dickinson, to make some marks at one of the concurrent sessions. And I, I, I developed a concept, which I'm still trying to explore some 30 plus years hence, on the values and influences our cultural parks, our museums, on improved, what I call intergroup relations in a cultural society. And what I think about that is, is that if I know more of your history as an African American, and if the American Indian know more about my history, I know more about their history, the Latino, then we can see our coming together in, in a oneness uh, or in a united sense. And I, I, I think that unfortunately we've allowed ourselves to sort of drift apart in not sharing our experiences and uniting us. So I think that the, the museum, the park play a great role in that. And every time I go to the National Museum, I'm beginning to see more of the face of America, which is so, so gratifying. And then I see the museum becoming a destination for family reunion, grandparents bringing their young people to experience it. I mean, that is poetry in motion. And we just need to do more of that if we're going to declare ourselves as a united nation or united people moving in one direction. I think that's so powerful what you just said. And, and part of this is that sometimes we who work in the sector forget how powerful the informal communities we create are that people come together who don't know each other at a site and suddenly are made better. <laughs> yeah. Or people come to a museum and see a story and they're changed. That's and right. I've always been struck by something that happened at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. One of, the, one of the most important areas in the museum is the story of Emmett Till. Oh um, yeah. Who yeah. was murdered in 1955. Yeah. 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 And so his mother used to tell me in Chicago that part of the job of a good historian is to help people remember and help carry the burden of memory. So we did this exhibition, which really recreates the funeral of Emmett Till, where his mother kept the casket open. And I was in there one day, and there was a young African-American woman, probably in her early 20s, and she didn't know this story, and she's just crying. Broke down crying as hard as she could. There was then a probably a 60, 65-year-old white man who knew the story and hesitated. But then went up to her and said, I am in pain like you are in pain. Is it okay? And this is pre-pandemic. Yeah. Could I hug you? <laughs> and they did. And they found an informal community at that moment that allowed them both to be changed, to find out of the depths of pain an opportunity for people to come together. So that's why for me, history is something that gives me hope, always gives me hope. Because how could you not be hopeful 
when you look back at history and see enslaved people who believed in an America that didn't believe in them. How could you not be hopeful when you look yeah. back and see communities creating HBCUs and educational opportunities yeah. because they knew education was the key to transformation? Yeah. How could you not be moved and made better by someone like John Lewis, who sacrificed so much to help a country live up to its stated ideals? So for me, while history tells me about the pain, shares with me the scars of the past. It also gives me a solve to bomb, to make that better, to make me believe in a better day. Yeah, excellent, Lonnie. A couple of programs which you and I discussed and worked on over the years is to increase the uh, presence around the preservation conservation table, to make sure that all members in all segments of our society are engaged in preserving our collective heritage and in important, the importance of it. Uh, and uh, while at the council, we uh, uh, introduced a number of programs to increase uh, diversity participation in historic preservation, and certainly to be anchored uh, by the active involvement of our young people. And we launched some programs to encourage young people to go into uh, historic preservation maybe as a career or to own a uh, major architectural firm in the future, focusing on, on, uh, on historic preservation or improving historical structures. So that's, that's very, very exciting. Well, I think it's powerful in a way to recognize that those who work in this field have an obligation. The yeah. obligation used to be to make sure you told good history. Yeah. That's yeah. still part of the obligation. But the obligation is also, how do you model the stories that matter to everybody? And how do you model the kind of diversity within your staff? Um, because if we're going to say part of what we're doing is helping a country be made better, then we've got to be the exemplars of that. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you and I have both been in places where years ago and not also not that long ago, <laughs> um, we integrated places. Oh, yeah, um, that's true. You know, I used to always sing an old Al Green song, I'm so tired of being alone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think that in a way, the professions have changed. Through work like yours, you've got more people involved, more diverse people. Yes. But the challenge is still at leadership level, within museums, at curatorial levels, the positions that really shape the way an institution moves forward. And it's been important for me to model that. So when I created the African American Museum with my colleagues, I said, I want to make sure that since this is a story of America and that millions of Americans will come in who are very diverse, I wanted to make sure my staff was diverse. So I think I have one of the most diverse, I had when I was there, one of the most diverse staffs in America because I felt you can't tell America's story if America isn't represented <laughs> in who's go. putting that together. Yeah. So that to me was one of my major commitments. And I think that the challenge for the profession is we have the scholarship that allows us to tell stories that we didn't tell before. Because you remember when people said, oh, there weren't, those aren't real stories, there's not good scholarship. Well, yeah. the scholarship is there. Yeah. But now it's also a question of how do we make sure that we model the behavior, the expectations, the diversity that we want to see from the rest of the country. Because the world is looking at how cultural institutions play the role of being the glue that yeah. help hold yeah. nations together to be that glue yeah. and you need to make sure you're diverse and that you really are helping people remember what they need to remember, not just what they want to remember. Excellent, Lonnie. That's a good segue for me to uh, acknowledge what would have been his 100th uh, birthday this year, Secretary of the Interior, the Honorable Stuart Lee Udall. At the First World Parks Congress in Seattle in uh, 1962, he announced that uh, the Park Service would be establishing an office for international affairs, recognizing the importance to share experiences in the management, the preservation of not only our natural heritage, but our cultural heritage. There's so much we can learn across international boundaries to import the same philosophy that you have shared. The truth has no geographical boundaries. Right. Right. We know and we need the truth. People thirst for the truth. and know you build upon the truth. 
So through the uh, efforts of the International Affairs Office, ICOMOS and many partners, taking a look at a serial nomination that would uh, develop a package or a, a number of uh, civil war sites into a World Heritage designation that we could share to the world that uh, we have made some grievous mistakes. We have stumbled uh, Selma to Montgomery, uh, Little Rock Central High School, whatever the case may be, to be honest and share it not only with ourselves, but to the world that we are growing, we are growing up where we can recognize our mistakes and we're prepared, hopefully, to learn and to build upon them. So, well, you know, we'll in, be... so, in, in some ways, I was going to say the, the two, the many things I've learned in my career, but two things were crucially important. One was to recognize that how much we learn when we're working internationally. Yes, um, yes. You know, how much we see both commonalities. It allows us to ask questions about what is American exceptionalism, um, whether it was watching the way South Africa f found truth and reconciliation through a process of healing, yes. whether it was working in Japan and learning the challenges of different cultures within the Japanese sector. Um, I think that was really important. So one, that we need to all recognize that we're made better when we look nat internationally. But the second piece that's very different than when sort of I started, which was the notion that you become a better historian when you know the living community. <laughs> when yes. you basically recognize that your challenge in a cultural institution, maybe even in the national parks, your challenge is to recognize you can't become, as I said earlier, you can't become a community center but you sure could become the center of your community. Yeah. And that's what I that's what I aspire to. I like that. I'm going to keep that concept in mind, Lonnie. It's I, all uh, yours. Okay. <laughs> they uh well, uh, Lonnie, uh, somebody was encouraging me to uh hang up my spares and put the old mount out to pasture, but I told him I got a couple more miles to make on this journey. <laughs> uh, you have but, you have you have led the way for so many of us. You have really sort of work through the system of the National Park Service. You've made it better by that process. Your leadership is something that I still take notes on and you know, wish I could be as good a leader as you. I mean, in many ways, we have been so fortunate and I wanna just acknowledge that I think that your work, your commitment to fairness has been really amazing. And so I wanted to thank you. And I know that our time is coming to an end, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we as a nation, we as a profession, have been made better by Robert Stanton. Well, Lonnie, same to you, and I really appreciate it more than you'll ever realize. We will conclude, uh, Lonnie and, uh, and Doug. Uh, Lonnie and I both have, in a way, referenced uh, the wisdom of one who has played a tremendous role, who has been very influential on our philosophy and our practice. Lonnie, while developing the uh, the National Museum had this particular gentleman to be the chair of his scholarly committee. And while I served as a director, he was the chairman of the, the congressionally authorized National Park System Advisor Board. And I speak of none other than the late Dr. John Hope Franklin. And let me just share you his wisdom, which pretty much summarized the wisdom and the perspective that Lonnie has so eloquently and powerfully offered. In the words of Dr. John Hope Franklin, the places that commemorate sad history are not places in which we are to allow ourselves or to really wallow in remorse, but instead places in which we may be moved, may be moved to a higher resolve to become better citizens. That's why we do this work, friends, and thank all of you for joining us. Let us all become better citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, our host, Doug Comer of ICOMOS. Doug, all yours. Thank you again, Doug, for this opportunity. I wish that we could continue with that discussion. Um, thank you, Secretary Bunch, Bunch and Director Stanton. That was fascinating. It was an honor and it was beautiful. Uh, you gave us so much to think about. And thank all of you who are fortunate enough to attend this plenary session. You can find the link to, the, to join the next session on our conference website. The next session, International Examples of Monuments Associated with Oppression, will begin at 1.40 p.m. We will have some outstanding presenters and discussants. 
you will have the opportunity to ask questions of the presenters and discussants using the Zoom Q&A box. I think that you will see how what is to come follows on from what has been said. And with that, um, I look forward to seeing you uh, at 1.40 p.m. Thank you all.